Hello and welcome. I am David Kreil. It's my pleasure to be your host today in the seminar of the Institute of Advanced Research in Artificial Intelligence. Today, um, we're very privileged to have Ken Forbes with us. Ken Forbes is the Walter P. Murphy Professor of Computer Science and Professor of Education at Northwestern. He started his early academic career at MIT, working on physical reasoning already in the early 80s. And he's now interested in a wide range of fields spanning artificial intelligence, cognitive sciences, human computer interaction, education, and games. In AI, he's been really moving um, the state of the art in qualitative, spatial, and analogical reasoning, learning from natural language, sketch understanding, and inference engine design. He's actually well known for developing the structure mapping engine based on cognitive theory by Deirdre Genter. And he's a fellow of the Association of the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, the Cognitive Science Society, the ACM, and the AAAS. He has received the Humboldt Award and was the inaugural winner of the Herbert A. Simon Prize for Advances in Cognitive Systems. Today, he will share with us his recent work on exploring qualitative representations in natural language semantics, which is quite complementary to the type of work we do here at the Institute. And we're really looking forward to learning from him. Thank you so much for being with us, Ken. I'm excited to hear about your work. Thank you for that kind introduction, David. We really appreciate it. OK. So I'm going to tell you about work we've been doing exploring qualitative representations in natural language semantics. And of course, I'll start out reviewing what qualitative representations are and why they're interesting and important in human cognition. And then I'll look at how we've been um, embedding qualitative process theory in natural language. Then I'll go on to something more advanced, the idea of type-level qualitative models, which turns out is very important for scaling and for making a, a better bridge to natural language semantics. Um, I'll talk about analogical question answering training. So as you'll see, we have a very different approach to natural language. And one of the things we'd like to do is um, train the systems, but we want to train them. We're lazy. I don't believe in hand annotating data. Okay. I mean, if you're going to hand annotate data, it better be a handful of data. That's all I'm willing to do. No millions, not even thousands, not even hundreds. Okay, and with analogy, you don't need to do that. I'll talk about some frontiers and some final thoughts. So just to warm you up, you put a tea kettle on a stove, crude stove technology here, and you leave it unattended for an hour. Not a good idea, right? You all know that. I did that once with a, an espresso maker, and I got a, a pile of melted aluminum on the burner. Okay, it was very hard to get off. And, and you know what's going to happen, right? So the water's going to heat up, and after a while, it's going to boil. So that's a qualitative state. That's a transition to another qualitative state. Then after a while, the steam is going to heat up, if there's any left in the, in the kettle and then it's going to melt. Now you notice that we got that without numerical simulation. You'll find some people talking about the game engine in the head. I'll come back to that in a minute and make fun of it. Um, but the idea is that for everyday reasoning, a lot of what you do is qualitative. And when it's not qualitative, then two things are happening. You're using a kind of everyday rough and ready heuristic calculation, or you're using the qualitative analysis to frame a more professional analysis. So physicists and other scientists, engineers, all use qualitative <laughs> representations, not as their final answer, but to figure out what the interesting questions are. I'll show you an example of that. So qualitative representations is a formal language for human reasoning about continuous systems. And again, we don't need numerical values or equations. People who've never met a differential equation in a classroom or on the street are perfectly capable of reasoning about that tea kettle. Professional reasoning does use qualitative reasoning, as I said, to frame questions. And a lot of qualitative representation research has focused on the physical world. In fact, some people called it qualitative physics. But it turns out it's actually much more general than that. So we've used it in moral decision-making to look at 
utilitarian versus deontological decisions, blame assignment, modeling emotions. There's all sorts of places in modeling continuous aspects of the social world and the mental world where this matters. So what makes qualitative representations different? One is the kind of mathematics it uses. So here's F equals MA, our old friend from school. This is a great equation, right? You can put people on the moon with it, given enough numbers, but you need a lot of numbers. So it often gives you answers that are more detailed than what you really need. And for everyday reasoning, it's unrealistic to think that you have all that data. Now here's a qualitative version. A is qualitatively proportional to the force. So this means a partial monotonic causal dependency. A will go up if F goes up, all else being equivalent. A is qualitatively inversely proportional to mass. If the mass is higher, it'll go up less. So you notice you can learn those two statements differently. I can figure out one and not have figured out the other yet. So you can actually compose these things to construct equations. And you notice it's monotonic. I didn't say it's linear. I didn't say it's quadratic. I didn't say anything, just increasing monotonic. That's the minimum information you need to push a change in sign here to a change of sign there in terms of causal reasoning. So the whole point is what's the minimum that gets you human-like reasoning? <coughs> so qualitative process theory is built on a kind of qualitative mathematics. I'll show you a little, here's two containers with water in F and flowing into water in G. And the idea is that causal changes come from processes. So it's not just these objects, there's another conceptual object, the liquid flow. And that you think of that when you think about what's happening in the situation. And that liquid flow imposes constraints, influences. So there's properties that are directly changed and that I plus and I minus indicate a direct change. The amount of water in F is decreasing. The amount of water in G is increasing. And this is like those qualitative proportionalities, they're partial, except these, the combination rules are addition and subtraction. And that means you can, for instance, reason about relative rates balancing with ordinal information. Okay, it's designed to capture okay, natural reasoning. So the amount causes the level to change, the level causes the pressure to change. And so these qualitative proportionalities, these are associated with the process. These are associated with being the nature of contained fluids. And now, if you think about human reasoning in a lot of domains, this does a pretty good job. A domain where, where it doesn't do a good job is analog electronics. It turns out there's there's technical reasons why people use different causal models in that domain. But every other domain we've looked at for continuous systems, this does a great job. Now, I mentioned qualitative simulation. So here's a qualitative state where you've got water flowing. And you know what's going to happen, right? This is going down. That's going up. So eventually, you're going to transition into a state <coughs> Ah. where they're equivalent. And so that transition occurs when this ordinal changes to an equality. So that's an interesting insight, right? Because it says, if I'm going to represent value indirectly, ordinal relations that tell you when processes start and stop give you a level of representation that's very minimal, but very natural. And so now that makes sense because that's one of the conditions for liquid flow. So it's the processes that tell you what ordinal comparisons to make. Okay, so it's all organized around kind of functional reasoning. Now let's think about mental simulation. So, you know, there's a common intuition. You kind of run the situation in your mind, you see what happens. And simulation, well, simulation, you could do a game engine in the head, for example. 
people have made such proposals going back decades. Okay, they've never really worked very well. Today, the simulators are better, so they, they look like they work a little bit better, but there's a ton of reasons to rule these things out. So first of all, mental simulation happens in brains. Clock rate of our brains is about 60 hertz. Okay, we're slow. We have a lot of neurons, but we're slow. Whereas from computer science, we know, if I'm gonna reason about liquids, for example, computational fluid dynamics takes gigahertz clock speed. It's essentially a serial process. Parallel doesn't help you. So if you try to do realistic, real-time reasoning about fluids on a processor like this, you're going to overclock it. And as I like to torture the game industry and the head people, you're gonna cook the meat, right? You overclock a CPU that fast, it's gonna have bad thermal effects. It's just not possible. We also come up with multiple outcomes. Now, if you're gonna do that, then you have to do Monte Carlo simulation. And if you look at the complexity of Monte Carlo simulation, it's exponential in the number of digits of accuracy. And it turns out Monte Carlo simulation is the problem that it often skips solutions if you try to cheat and do things very low resolution. I can tell you a funny story about military simulation um, offline if you like. Now, the other thing is it's fast and often effortless. It doesn't feel like step-by-step -step reasoning. Now, envisioning, which is a technique I'm about to show you, is kind of step-by-step -step reasoning. And so that's one way to think about it. Another way is what we're actually doing when it's basically like watching a movie unroll is we're doing it by analogy. And I've written a lot about that elsewhere. I'm not going to go into much detail here. The key idea is with partial knowledge, you've got ambiguity. So we have our kettle heating up on the stove. <clears throat> we already, in our mental simulation, ignored some of the possibilities. Okay, a first principles envisioner would say, that can happen. But it'll also say, well, maybe the stove is so low, it's below the boiling point. That's perfectly possible. And so that really is a possible behavior here. But of course, none of us thought about it because we were using experience. And now when you've got the thing cooking, it could melt or it could be made of sterner stuff and just sit there being very, very hot and dangerous to the touch. So envisionments describe all the possible behaviors. Now, if you're doing engineering, then you might say, well, I wanna make sure I've got some real klutzes in my kitchen so I'm gonna pick a material such that this is what happens. And so doing this reasoning at design time in the engineering is called failure modes and effects analysis. And you can also use this to design control software or as the people at Xerox Park have done, use it to make systems that self-model so that when you turn on one of their multi-billion dollar line copiers, you flip the switch this thing can print a hardcover book in one minute flat, including book binding. And it's monitoring the paper as it goes through in real time using qualitative models to help figure out which paper paths to use. And it built that model dynamically. When you powered it up, it sensed what parts were plugged in. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff you can do with this. Now, the reason why people do this is you can get a lot of surprising amount of information out of this. So here's a spring block oscillator, crudely drawn. And this is this envisionment. Now you notice that since there's a loop in behavior here, that indicates it's an oscillation. And now if you've got friction, well, if you've got dynamic friction, eventually it's gonna stop and if it's static friction, where it's going like this, but now the excursion is so small that the static friction overcomes the pull of the spring, you're gonna have two places it can stop. And so this captures both kinds of friction. So, so you get a lot of subtle behavior out of just purely qualitative simulation. Okay, so 
hopefully I've convinced you now the qualitative representations have a lot of valuable properties. So now let's talk about them in language. We talk about continuous things a lot. The world's a continuous place. Heat flows from the hot brick to the cool room. Sentence straight out of the solar energy textbook. <clears throat> if you want Tom to like you better, help him with programming, right? You're increasing Tom's affinity for you and helping isn't a one and done thing, right? As he watched the show, his disgust increased until he couldn't stand it anymore and walked out. Okay, we use all sorts of continuous models of ourselves and we often use metaphors to everyday physical behaviors. He blew up at someone. That's an explosion of anger, right? So qualitative representations are an important component of natural language semantics. So here's how we do natural language. We focus on deep understanding. So we're willing to simplify syntax like humans do for children. We have James Allen's off the shelf parser, discourse representation theory, pack semantics builder, which is really cool. So for example, it handles logical and numerical quantification. So the heart has four chambers. <coughs> there was a learning by reading system. When you told it that, it would make a data structure for chamber zero, chamber one, chamber two, chamber three, explicitly laying it out. You say to that same system, the brain has six billion neurons, and you get to find out how their system handles heap blowouts, okay? because you can't make all those objects. Quotation, you're gonna do blame assignment. Go ahead with the program, said the vice president. I don't care about the environment. That's from, in fact, one of the stimuli used in the human subjects experiment that we modeled. Counterfactuals, if the dam is open, 20 species of fish will become extinct. So you have to be able to do counterfactuals in language too. And now, we use basically the open psych knowledge representation. We built a lexicon. And this part comes from what we call narrative function, where basically the system is using the task to provide constraints on what the interpretation has to be. So here's, here's from, from an older version of the system. Here's from one of the moral decision problems. Because of a dam on the river, 20 species of fish will become extinct. So this is the classic discourse representation theory description of it. And here is the predicate calculus version. Notice here's the numerical quantification, right? It's a group of species that's an instance of set mathematical. Its cardinality is 20. Okay, and for every species, if it's a member of that group, then there's a group of fish, et cetera, that's gonna go, gonna go extinct. So, it's a great thing. I mean, if you end up having psych style knowledge representations, each one of these subcontexts becomes a micro theory. And if you're in the semantic web world, think of them as named graphs because it's basically the same idea. The same guy, RV Guha, invented both the psych micro theory notion and the named graphs in RDF. Now, the language approach we're using, you know, there was a thing for a while doing semantic parsers for each special problem. And then it would take god awful amounts of data to train them up. Well, you don't have a separate language system for everything you do. So what do you do instead? So things like lexical and semantic, syntactic analysis and semantic choice sets and DRT, these are all general purpose. Every domain you do, you use these. But then reasoning about how to interpret stuff like qualitative process theory or step semantics, which includes QPT, but also has discrete events, that starts getting more domain specific. And there's task specific things like intent recognition. So realizing you have a question and so forth. So the idea is you don't have to learn everything from scratch. We're doing a new task we learn up here. We don't have to learn down here. Okay, so think of us as lazy. 
Now, to get to the to QP theory mappings, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about QP theory. First of all, remember I said physical processes cause changes. So for instance, heat flow. Well, a process has participants like the hot brick and the cool room. Conditions where there's a difference in temperature between them and consequences, direct influence. Heat is going to be drawn from here. Heat is going to be added to here. And because these things are normal thermal objects, removing heat from here is going to cause this temperature to drop, it's going to cause that temperature to rise. And if you let that go on long enough, you'll have equilibration, i.e. the condition for heat flow will no longer be true. And now there'll be a thermal equilibrium. Now, how do you turn this into language? Well, you know, as it happens, there's some pretty smart people in linguistics. So frame semantics, and in particular, we're, we're drawing on FrameNet, basically built structured representations to link lexical items and conceptual structures. Like you've got the idea of transactions. So you've got commerce and expensiveness as frames and a whole bunch of mappings from words to aspect of these frames. So we said to ourselves, ha, huh, we can use this. So the idea is we've defined an embedding of QP theory in frame semantics. So it's a small collection of QP frames that basically express the fundamental ideas of qualitative process theory, but basically are frame-like because why do you have frames in language? You have frames in language because you're incrementally building up information. And that happens with these representations too. Same kind of thing. So basically, these are identical formally to QB theory, so we can reason with them, but they're tied to language. So we work to identify the syntactic and semantic realizations of QP frames. For example, this pattern, as some quantity changes, quantity two changes, that we translate into qualitative proportionality. As the volume increases, the density decreases. Density causally depends on the volume. Okay. And so that's a way of going to a quality, there's like a half a dozen patterns like this that reliably let you detect qualitative proportionalities. Ordinal relations, kind of straightforward, right? Greater than um, temperature of the brick, temperature of the room, nice simple frame structure. Notice you could have said the brick is hotter than, right? In some cases in English, we bundle up the dimension with the comparative. Um, Indirect influences, as the temperature goes up, the relative humidity goes down, and so on. One of the first things we did when we started looking at embedding QP theory into language was to say, well, okay, the frame that people independently developed a bunch of process frames. How compatible are what they are doing with what we did? And it turned out very nicely. So from the motion domain, the man rushes along the street, that's the path, right? From his house to the store, source, destination. And you can map that into participants and in QP theory just fine. So we built code that actually can learn QP models by reading. So you start dropping in language, you get the sort of default things the language system does. This is now not the site KB, it's a thing called next KB, which has open site knowledge, but it's open license. Okay, so you can't pass out site on the street, but you can pass out open site. And so next KB includes a kind of curated set of open site knowledge, plus a lot of our own stuff. Narrative functions then help you identify QP frames and then you get model fragments for frames. And we tried running this over four chapters of the free manual in simplified English. It wasn't bad. 
Decision 88%, recall 42%. Several sources of difficulty. So people with intermingled continuous and discrete models, we've actually got a new idea called step semantics that integrates those two, um, which is one way of approaching it. And incomplete narrative functions for recognition. And there, the new analogical training techniques um, or how we're addressing that one. So before I get to analogical training, let me tell you about type level versus instance level. So in engineering systems, you've got a schematic and the world is simple, right? You have models for the parts and then you have the processes that occur amongst the parts and the schematic gives you everything, boom. You have some things created and destroyed like fluids and different parts of the system but they're always tied to a pre-existing structure. Now, suppose you think about qualitative modeling in the strategy game. So this is a version of Presiv. Pre it's an open domain version of Civilization II. You build the cities, you build units, you explore, you change the terrain by improving it, okay? So now there's objects coming and going all the time. And you've got a lot of these things. I mean, not as big as the nuclear power plant, okay? But you've got a lot of these things compared to the usual limitations people have on their mental capacities. And so you've got limited attention and storage. You can't propositionalize everything. And in this domain, humanities are created and destroyed all the time. And so you don't just have a schematic from which you build the model and then you just do all the reasoning within the model you built. You're constantly redoing the model. So that's why we extended QP theory to include type level qualitative models. So now predicates and collections, AKA categories, are arguments instead of domain theory, domain entities. So now let's just think about why you need this. So strategy games, you know, Go is hard, true. This is much more complicated than Go. Go is 19 by 19. These tend to be more like 4,000 tiles on a board. Multiple kinds of terrain, multiple kinds of units, a whole research tree, stochastic effects. You enter a hut, you have no idea what's gonna happen. You enter combat, you don't know what happens. Guns and butter trade-offs, but you're doing improvements in cities to improve the economy. Those trade off against military operations. There's a diplomacy subsystem. This thing is insanely more complicated. And so you can't basically just sort of build a complete model of everything and run with it. So to do this higher order qualitative reasoning, the idea is you use predicates and collections as arguments. So Here's a type level qualitative proportionality. QPROP plus type type, in other words, between two types of things. Pressure, temperature, gaseous object, gaseous object equals. What the hell is that? Well, here's how it's interpreted. So for all X and Y such, are such that they're both gaseous objects and X and Y are the same. Okay. So now this tells you what, how to interpret those three arguments then the pressure of X is qualitatively proportional to the temperature of Y. And that tells you how to interpret the rest. So in other words, I can instantiate this in particular situations and get out the kind of qualitative proportionality I need to reason about specific entities. But in terms of extracting it out from language, I don't have to have entities. I do something more general. So one thing you can do is add advice. So here's a piece of advice you might give someone in this game. Adding university in, city, in a city increases its science output. That turns into, through our language system, I'll show you how in just a moment, positively depends on type type. It's not a Q-prop because this is adding university. It's a discrete event, right? Measurable quantity funds, city science total. City science total is a parameter in the simulation that the machine can access. And this basically says, I'm treating this as something that's a quantity 
that's measurable in the simulation. And it has to be between a free city and having a university building where the city has improvement is the relation between. So as I make this be true, then that's gonna give me a positive increase in that science thing. Now, remember I said, you've got these levels of representation and the lowest levels are choice sets that are automatically produced. So if I give that piece of advice to the language system, yeah, this is God awful, sorry. Um, but, but let's walk through it really quick. So in the prepositional phrase gets selected as in under specified container, university city, because that's gonna give you something that's relevant to the kind of thing we're trying to get. The main relevant, the city versus the free civ city for the word city. And since it's actually knows we're in the domain of free civ, it picks that one. Same thing with FC building university instead of the more generic notion of university, then adding, adding could be an attachment, adding could also be doing addition, that's ruled out. Um, so adding is a physical incorporation and the thing incorporated is that university as done by, well, whoever the subject of the sentence was, okay? And then increases that's an increase event in the psych ontology. And the thing that's being increased is the science output as the increase is being done by the add. In other words, this is the cause of the increase. Now we put all that together. The stuff in green here is what the language system produces. And why does it produce that as opposed to something else? Because it's got narrative functions that are looking for things like this. And so it's doing abductive reasoning. So it's going through and saying, well, I'm trying to find a cause that prop. Well, if I were to pick this notion of add as opposed to adding two numbers together, then I get this property. And so by doing abductive reasoning and having patterns like this, yes. May I just ask uh, these numbers behind the, the words, do they suggest that this is an instance of a larger class or what do these numbers? Yes, yeah, so these are, these are, are what are called discourse variables. So they're, in, they're the logical variable that the, stands for the thing denoted by the word. So when I said university, it's gonna make a discourse variable and I hang all the properties about it off that discourse variable. Uh, so, so these are what the language system produces and that causal layer comes out of the semantic verification. Now you might say, does this help, right? I mean, it's nice that you can generate it, but it actually make a difference in gameplay. So we, we basically gave it about a half a dozen sentences and just with sentences about science, the green is the experimental condition. The baseline is the system running as normal and you'll notice that it actually improved population. Science helps people stay alive longer and science output turn per turn certainly increased the good expectancy. Now that's nice. Can we learn? Ooh, I already talked about that. Never mind. Um, duplicate slides. This is okay. Now I mentioned QP frames several times now. And so you think about incrementality in language. Production depends on population. Okay, so the sentence says, well, I've got this production, this depends on as a qualitative proportionality, and this is an antecedent. But population of what? So that depends on context. So if I'm, I'm asking the system, what does the production in Chicago depend on? It's about the population of Chicago. If I'm saying, well, what does the production of a city depend on in more general terms? I'm not talking about a particular city. I'm talking about cities in general. So in other words, if this is a type level or instance level statement, it's actually a function of context. So, so a frame system needs to support assembly of models from incremental information. And when you look at our previous systems, you know, the first one of these we built was back in 2004, turn of the century, right? 
that did instance level models and that worked very nicely and it showed you actually could make these mappings great. Then as we added type level models, a different grad student built an entirely different system that had narrative functions for producing type level QP frames. And the problem is these things are great in the right context, but they're not something you can easily merge together, right? If you knew you were reading nothing but generic text, then hey, you'd use this. If you knew you're just talking about instances in a dialogue, you just use this, but you can't. And so we step back and say, what do we have to do? The answer is one kind of frame system that has both. Turns out you can actually do this. You can actually make most of the frame system be totally independent of whether it's type level or instance level. So the same kinds of causal laws and applicability conditions apply to both instance and type level. But then the differences are in the entities. Are they types or instances? So, so let me just show you a sample from this. This is still very much in progress. So production depends on population. Here's the parse tree um, and it's what you'd expect. Choice sets. So you notice the city population got picked because it's free sieve. Production got picked. And so the, these are the semantic interpretation statements. And so now you get an influence frame, which is an indirect influence, say the qualitative proportionality. And the constrained parameter is production. And the constrainer is population. So it gives you the kind of thing you'd expect. So you can make these things and make them agnostic. So now a second level of interpretation takes these universal QP frames and instantiates them into either type level or instance level. So our next goal is to do a full implementation that handles all the QP language patterns and test it both by interactive dialogue and learning by reading. Now, I kept mentioning narrative functions. How do you get those? Well, obviously you'd like to learn them, but you don't want to have millions of examples and you don't want hand annotation. So how do you adapt this thing? How do you do those new things? Ideally without annotated data and with high data efficiency. So here's the trick. Suppose I've got questions and answers both in English. Now, sometimes you do have to annotate, and I'll show you why in just a minute. But here, no. In this case, you take the interpretations the language system gives you, and so you get the space of it, interpretations, and you do a connection graph that links them up and says, well, given this set of questions and given the set of answers, for these answers to be the answers to this question, then I have to make these semantic choices for that to work. And that's the essence of it, because now you can produce some what we call query cases that are basically simple cases that then you apply to an analogy to new situations. And these are basically a kind of narrative function. So let me talk about analogy for a moment. So we're using dead regentner structure mapping theory, as, as David mentioned in the beginning. There's psychological evidence showing that this works from visual reasoning through conceptual change and pretty much everywhere in between. We now, by the way, have computational evidence also for these same claims. And of course, qualitative representations. So here's our analogy stack. Structure mapping engine used for matching. I have something I'm trying to explain here. I have this other relational description I got somehow, and it has things I can project onto it. To, to give me new explanations. Now I have a retrieval model that uses a large knowledge base as both semantics and generalizations from experience. And those generalizations also get built by a thing called SAGE, which uses SME to mush together things, producing probabilistic schemas. Okay, so this thing is constantly producing these schemas 
And, and that's the essence of our companion cognitive architecture. Now we've used this analogy stack in a lot of experiments. Some moral decision making, so we use analogies to help de detect protected values, and we can show improvements as the case library grows. Knowledge based completion, state of the art on two data sets as of 2015, with a thousand times fewer examples, right? That's three orders of magnitude improvement in data efficiency while providing explanations. Okay, so that's, we think that's pretty dramatic. Transfer learning protects with problem solving and in games, learning by reading, including multimodal learning by reading, learning theory of mind, again, modeling some psychological results, but also building things that work with agents and simulation. And vision, well, we've now got data efficient, um, deep learning level performance on skept object recognition, training efficient, deep level performance on visual relation detection and visual QA. And like the other forms of analogical learning, it's incremental and inspectable. Now, how incremental and inspectable? Let me show you with a classic in machine learning, GeoQuery, right? <clears throat> so, which capitals are in states that border Texas? Well, capital could mean money, or it could mean a, a geopolitical distinction. State could be a geopolitical division, or it could be solid liquid gas, state of matter, right? But given that these are cities, capital has to be the geopolitical one, and this has to be the geopolitical one. So you can figure that out by the connection graph. So that's one training example. I give it one more training example. What rivers are in Utah? Well, Colorado is a river, but it's also a state. Green is a color as well as a state. San Juan is a city as, as well as a river. But by heavens, for this question to work and give you these answers, these all have to be rivers, okay? Now, just those two training examples, just those two, you can already answer what rivers flow through states that Alabama borders. Because again, we're using a general purpose language system, right? That can handle the syntactic processing and apply those query cases to new situations. It can also handle what are the cities and states through which the Mississippi flows. Then you notice there's lots of stuff in here that's not explicitly in any of these, but it's compositional. It's how compositional what are the cities and states that border states through which the Mississippi flows? It handles that too, okay? So insanely compositional. So in terms of, for those of you who are fans of GeoQuery, you know there's bugs in the original data set. We ran ours both uncorrected and corrected. We couldn't tell what everybody else did, but basically we're competitive with all these folks. Um, everybody here, used annotated data and we don't and Percy used a whole bunch of domain specific stuff and again we don't now we trained it and because it's inspectable we can have a system automatically look at which cases got used in generating an answer and automatically construct an optimal training sequence okay so just how much can you get with how little is what we we're trying to answer with that so with just 10 example training questions, you're already 58% accurate. And by the time you get to 50 questions, you're already pretty much close to what simple validation does. So this is, this is incredible data efficiency. So we put this to work in several ways. Um, it's been deployed in an interactive kiosk. If you come to the computer science department at Northwestern, you can interact with this thing. It's sitting on a wall in the reception area. Speech and vision interaction. Um, who teaches machine learning? It tells you where's that person's office. It tells you and shows it on a map. Now the showing on the map part is where you have to annotate the data, right? Because the command where here's the procedure you use to make the map display, that's not something you're gonna express in natural language. So we're willing to do it. But the thing is, look at that. 
11 question answer pairs per question type on average. And we didn't strike for minimality, we just sort of tried something that worked. It takes a whole five minutes to train on the tablet. Okay, so it's data efficient and training efficient. We've used this for several other things. Um, one of the coolest recently is to extract knowledge by combining analogy and language models. So learning facts like generics. So here's how it works. You've got a knowledge base, right? And so you have a, a, a training sentence that says, purr is a sound made by cats. System understands that. And it figures out by connection graph techniques, well, given this, this probably ties to this fact I know, animal type makes sound type domestic cat purring sound. That's a type level statement encapsulating the generic. So you take the query cases you would need to do that, just like you took query cases for geoquery, and you store those away. Now I give you new sentences, and I get things like um, dogs make different sounds, including barking. Not syntactically very close at all, right? But the semantics are close. And that lets the system infer that it should take an animal type make sound type dog barking sound as one of the learned facts. So we ran this over 2,600 simple English Wikipedia entries. And here's the results. So here's straight old deep learning stuff with some fine tuning for the task. Um, not terribly great, right? I mean, T5, BERT relation extraction, CNNs. Analogy, 46%, beat all of them. Just straight old ana analogical QA training. Analogy plus BERT, 71%. Now what was BERT doing for us? It did two things. First thing it did was, we used it for word sense disambiguation. Danilo found some already annotated frame net data saying, here's which frame to use given this sentence. And did a little bit of fine tuning of BERT with that data because we have a mapping to frame net through our semantics. That's not a very broad mapping because our language system is much broader than frame net. Um, so it helps some, but not too much. Then the other thing was a clever technique for estimating whether or not a learned fact is plausible based on doing some post-training on contents of the knowledge base. Okay, so that's where, where we got the 71. So we're excited about that. So if you look at where this is going, there's, there's, there's two, big, two big problems, two big frontiers. One is breadth of language. Currently we're limited in syntactic complexity. And so we're, we're, we're approaching two different ways. One is to hybridize with language models. Maybe that'll work, I don't know. But there's another thing also. Humans constantly puzzle out language, especially when they don't know much about the domain being read about. And that's true of anything that a machine reads, right? These are idiot savants from Mars. They do not come from where we come from. And so <clears throat> if you systems ought to puzzle out meanings using world, world knowledge like people do. So in other words, this is a very reasoning intense, very reasoning intense way of doing things. So we're approaching, we're, we're looking at both approaches. I don't know, I don't know which is going to help the most. The second challenge is knowledge accumulation. So we want to build systems that learn and adapt over their lifespan without AI experts in the loop. If I have to have someone under the hood constantly tinkering, that's a non-starter. And so the systems themselves have to have explicit strategies for testing knowledge. We've done a little bit of this in learning by reading, rumination where the system asks itself questions to test knowledge, but there's so much more to go. So just to wrap up, qualitative representations, I think are an important component of natural language semantics, quantities, signs of derivatives, ordinals, et cetera. QP theory representations can be extracted from English and our new unified QP frame system integrates type and instance levels. It's incomplete, but that's more a matter of cranking and getting stuff done. Analogical training is a new data efficient and inspectable way to learn narrative functions for semantic interpretation. 
And um, I think the new frontiers here are scaling both in language coverage and knowledge accumulation. Okay, thank you for listening. <laughs> Questions? Thank you so much. Yes, questions, uh, Daniel. Uh, thanks very much for a very nice talk. So um, if I understand correctly, your the model that you use, it's if, if I would have to give it a name, it would use explainable embeddings. So because in machine learning world, could you kind of a bit elaborate on how this approach, because in, in machine learning, we have the problem that usually we can't explain how right. the system comes to a conclusion. So I, I like this very much that if I understand correctly, you can basically go back into the system and see how a specific answer is gener generated, how, right. how it comes to this. Is, do you have a perspective how this could be used uh, to improve embeddings that are more or less a black box in? in yeah. So, so. <laughs> You know, there was a, a television show in the United States called Orange is the New Black, where it's talking about people in prison. And instead of black being fashionable, orange was fashionable because that's what prison jumpsuits are. Well, so, so as a joke, a slogan I use sometimes is um, structure mapping is the new dot product. So, so here's an analogy. Feature vectors, tensors, matrices, dot product. Relational representations, structure mapping. So suppose I, I have a machine learning algorithm that uses dot product. And I want to do something that actually uses relational representations. So if I have relational representations, I can put them in the natural language generation and have them explained to people, right? So, so I mean, I think there's two reasons for the efficiency of analogical learning. And one of them is relational representations. And, and so, for instance, um, in the uh, link plausibility work, what we did was basically say, well, look, you got these relational representations. And everybody else pureed them into tensors or matrices or, or vectors, right? And then trained up their deep learning models. What we did was we basically did a path algorithm and built 10 cases, 10 positive, 10 negative. And what do you do with the negative cases? With the negative cases, what you did was you did structured logistic regression over the relational representations. So in other words, there's the normal weights you get in matching, but this system learned additional weights based on the positive and negative examples. Because normally similarity only says, hey, this is, this is a good thing, right? It normally is only additive, it never subtracts. But you can learn negative weights with logistic regression. And you can do logistic regression over a structured representation by using structure mapping to tell you what things line up. All a feature vector is doing is telling you what goes with what. And structure mapping computes that in a human-like way for relational representations. So that's one example. Another is um, you can make a sport vector machine using analogical generalization. And it turns out in some early work that, that did, did quite well. I think our new techniques will beat it now for visual processing, but we don't know that yet. Um, another, you can take analogical generalization and use it to, to construct Bayes nets or probabilistic rules. Those turn out to be uh, Best performing in some counterterrorism exercises we did. So there's a lot of different ways you can hybrid, you can basically say, take a machine learning technique that uses feature vectors, replace it with relational representations, and then use structure mapping where you'd normally use a dot product. Like it's a general general recipe. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question from our remote audience um, whether you could. Please elaborate a little on the algorithms used to map natural language sentences to QP frames, and also what algorithms you use to perform reasoning, for instance, to 
infer new facts or answer questions? Sure. Both of those are, are, are complicated topics. So the language system, um, there was a slide that went over that really quickly, but basically syntactic parsing, we use James Allen's trains parser, publicly available. We have choice sets that are built out of a large scale lexicon that we created. And again, that's open license. The choice sets are tied to material from the open psych knowledge base, again, open license. We used to use research like, loved research like, really useful, great for many things, but, but not being able to pass it out just like hurt us, right? So we, we really wanted to be able to hand stuff out on the street corners. You can download all of Next KB. So, so basically, discourse representation theory for the higher levels of reasoning. And if you look at the, there's a nice huge book on discourse representation theory that the authors of the theory did. And one of my grad students, Emmett Tamai, basically bonded with that book and said, well, I've got, you know, micro theories. So if I have to have nested context, I can implement that with micro theories. And that's how it's implemented for us. So it's not, it's not a quick answer, but it's basically, you know, if you look at some of the papers we've done, and if you want to send me an email, I can send you pointers to some of them. You'll, you'll be able to get a lot of it pretty quickly. The reasoning happens either by analogy, and again, we've got papers on that too, or for QP theory, there's basically algorithms that do that. Um, the implementation, there's several papers on earlier implementations of QP theory, and reading any of those will give you a sense about how that works. Um, the new versions are much more incremental now and aimed at doing things more like what you saw with strategy games and doing things like hardcore engineering tasks. I personally don't do much engineering problem solving anymore. Johan de Clare still does that sort of stuff. Um, so I'm much more interested in cognitive modeling. So I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Um, okay, a question by Prabhu. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, so one of my, uh, I guess one question that I had was uh, when you mentioned uh, QP theory, like uh, what I understood was more or less that you're suggesting that all uh, mental processes can be reduced to these, uh, uh, I mean, can be described using uh, qualitative uh, process theory. Oh, I, I wouldn't say reduced to. Okay. <laughs> I would never say reduced to. Um, but for instance, um, if I'm doing metacognition, I look at a problem that I'm, that I'm trying, to, trying to solve. And one part of me is saying, can I do this right now? <laughs> you know, some part of you says, you know, I don't really have the energy for doing this sort of thing right now. Um, and so how are you doing that? It's almost certainly not a numerical simulation, right? I mean, we don't know what the quantities are in making those judgments. We don't know what their units are. We don't know any of that stuff. And so there's appraisals and emotions, right? So, so those are a bunch of variables and they do have numerical strengths. Exactly how those work is an interesting question. I mean, one of the things we've done is, is looked at how to make function estimations happen automatically by combining qualitative models with things that are quantitative both in terms of strategy games and also in the emotion modeling thing. So think of it as a constituent, as, as a component in some larger, more complex process. I, I couldn't write a QP model of problem solving that's covered all of problem solving. It just, you just can't do that. I, I mean, yeah, in theory, you could do it in the sense that it turns out you can build a Turing machine in QP theory. And once you build a Turing machine, you can do anything, but that's not an interesting sense. <laughs> um, maybe as a as a follow up, uh, I, I guess uh, I think you also mentioned this uh, fact that like human brains process at I guess sixty hertz, so you could not yeah. uh, do simulations. But uh, I guess if if you could predict like uh, multiple frames in one step, then you could still. Uh... Here's what goes wrong with that. Once upon a time, there was a. a a darker program called Deep Green. And there were two teams. 
and, and my team was the qualitative reasoning team. And we said, well, okay, we're gonna do spatial reasoning and we see these two trajectories, they intersect spatially. So if they intersect temporally, those units might interact and you gotta think about that. The other team believed in Monte Carlo simulation. And so they would take these steps, okay. And the problem is they were doing, these are really complicated situations. And so you had a half an hour of compute time to produce an answer. The Monte Carlo team used a network of supercomputers, computed for 29 and a half minutes, and then kicked out their answer. Now it turns out, if you increase the, multi, the time step, then you get things like this, bounce, bounce. You've missed an interaction. So their results were terrible compared to ours. And ours ran in a minute on one server and it was much more accurate. So many orders of magnitude, less compute, much more accurate answers by doing a clever bit of qualitative reasoning with a little bit of Monte Carlo, by the way, at the points where it mattered, right? When those units interact, that's a quantitative decision. But now you've used qualitative reasoning to frame the problem. And then you use whatever you need to, to solve that problem. That's the kind of pattern that's been used in QR over and over again. I see. So basically these are like shortcuts for reasoning, but it's not always the case that they might uh, that they might fail in some situations, but uh, they're basically shortcuts to come up with well, solutions. Think of, it, think of it like a level of representation that captures more broadly what's going on. Now, the other trick, the other thing that happens is if, I, if I've got qualitative representations, I can do analogy. So if I've seen things happen before, I put it on the stove, I turn on the heat and after a while it boils. I don't have to even think about limit points. I have this behavior and it looks like when, when people are learning about the physical world, we accumulate a lot of such examples. And one of my students, um, Scott Friedman, in his thesis showed that you can actually model a lot of examples of conceptual change that way. Basically by doing analogy over behaviors you've seen. So instead of a game engine in the head, think of it as a, a library of of observed behaviors in the head. And in some cases it just remains a library because you don't need anything else. In other cases you build broad generalizations. And in some cases you get book knowledge and you tie in with what the culture gives you. And then you can go really deep in terms of reasoning when you need to. That's what I think a more human-like way of doing this. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> If we may, there's another question from the remote yes. audience uh, who wonder with regards to the hierarchical type theory constructed for the game of uh, <clears throat> Free Civ City. Are these statements handcrafted and, and how are they related to efforts to use the apparent verbal knowledge encoded in large language models these days yeah. to learn um, world models in reinforcement learning? So, so the type level qualitative models are um, pretty much entirely learned. They're not handcrafted. So, and they're learned in two different ways. Well, three different ways. One is by reading, another is by advice, which is natural language also. And the third is by demonstration. Basically, you've got a, a person playing the game, the companion watching, and it starts reasoning to build up causal models about what's going on in the game and using those to infer qualitative descriptions. And so, for instance, when you, when you look at language models, dear God, the amount of data they require is huge, right? But you have a companion watching a person, and by the time that person has built a handful of cities in the game, it's figured out the causal models of cities perfectly well. And so just a little bit of observation with the sort of structure of causal models that I'm talking about here, not the specific causal models of the domain, but the ability to build causal models from observations is incredibly more efficient than reinforcement learning or deep learning. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Are there other questions from the audience in the room or remotely? Daniel? Uh, well, one more with regards to this uh, computer game. So my question is, it's very simple in fact. So when, when, the, when the game is played by, the, yeah. by, by a model, um, because we usually look at how well a model generalizes. So when you present a couple of more or less instructions or hints, it, it learns what to do. So is it possible to, to understand the increment between the baseline and the increase? It, so, is, is, it comes solely from a better decision making in terms of scientific placing a university, or does the model also learn something beyond that? So, so what we wanted to do, but the funding ran out, is take stories from our world and apply lessons learned in the game to our world, right? That, that would have been wonderful. We, we timed out on that, unfortunately. We have done work on transfer learning in games where these are our, our um, tile-based games and um, the system handle an independent DARPA evaluation where we hand the companion to the DARPA evaluators and they run all the training and testing. Um, 40 different distant analogs I mean, really distant analogs. So they were all still tile games. It wasn't trying to go from tile games to our world, for instance, which is what I would call deep transfer. But for them, this was deep transfer. Um, <clears throat> so that sort of thing we can do. Thank you very much. So there's another question from the remote audience yes. uh, who wonder that nowadays more and more models are end-to-end -end differentiable, so that yes. you can use optimizers in training. Um, in the particular task to, to, to uh, get them to learn. And uh, the, the um, member from the remote audience uh, wonders yeah. how you s position your work relative to those because these models perform well, but they're hard to explain. And they're wondering whether there's po oh. possibly a potential to combine aspects of your approach and their approach, or how, how would you see that? Yeah. So, 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 um... So I, I, I don't believe reasoning is differentiable. I just don't. John, John Lacroon and I disagree on this. Um, so if you have something that's really simple and really fixed, then you can do end-to-end -end learning in a deep learning system. If the world changes, then the amount of data that you have to gather to represent that changing world and go back to the drawing board and retrain. Yeah, you know, there's a reason why biology and evolution has modular systems. We don't optimize everything all together. We just don't. We'd be dead if we do. Engineering has modularity in systems. Like it's a fundamental property of building complex things. And there's nothing more complex we know of than cognition. So that's why I think end-to-end -end models are, if you're, if you're Google and you say, I want this particular thing to happen super efficiently, and I know what it is, it's gonna be the kinds of speech recognition people use in dialogues for everyday life. And I've got a ton of data that represents that. Go for it. If you're gonna build systems that reason and learn and adapt, that's not the way to do it. That's just not the way to do it. So I, I, okay, old joke. What's the most important leg of a three-legged stool? The one that's missing, right? So, so think of cognition as having three legs. Symbolic, relational representations. Statistics, which both traditional machine learning and deep learning do very well, but also similarity. And if you have all three, you can do things that neither one of them can do all by itself, and that even pairs of them can't do by themselves. So, you know, I think the future is hybrid. The question is how much, when, and where. I guess that was the, um, the, the, the idea behind the last part of the question from the audience. How, how would you see these to complement one another or to integrate? Yeah. Like, unless I misunderstood, you, you mentioned before that you had a very well-performing system that 
that used your, your reasoning approach and then Monte Carlo only for a, a very specific or very specific parts of the right. question. So I, I wonder in this context, um, for, for what parts of the thinking, if you like, would you use um, a traditional machine learning system and where would you use the reasoning? How would they interface? How would they integrate? So, so, so for instance, here's a, here's a great example from, from IBM's Watson and it's kind of what we did with BERT, okay? Which is basically you want evidence that something's common in language, okay? So Watson had a knowledge base automatically produced at the level of words called prismatic. They sliced and diced, and you could say, well, what kinds of activities did this entity, was this entity involved in? And you could use that as, a, as one source of evidence for disambiguation. Well, similarly, we had this idea of, we've got frame that information for disambiguation, and so we trained BERT to provide evidence about that, and also trained it to provide estimates about, you know, is this fact likely to be true or not? Okay, it actually led to noticeable improvements. So, so in other words, there's this piece of functionality where if I have the data to get the thing experience of a statistical sort, then I can have it provide evidence for downstream processes. It's never gonna be the one thing. And the idea that it's just the one true thing doing it, right? I mean. So there's other sources of evidence in our reasoning systems too. Um, and so you wanna combine those things. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Um, if, if I may, I, I have a question. Um, I was wondering also a little bit on the question of how, how complementary approaches could be maybe either joined or integrated in, in a way to get to extract the most value out of each. Um, you mentioned before that a lot of work has gone into systems that try to extract knowledge about named entities. Um, and that's not what you're doing. Um, we, we have seen that in situations where the number of named entities is very large, for instance, in the biomedical sector, we have genes. There are 50,000 <coughs> genes right. in many different organisms. So we're probably looking at a few hundred thousand different names. The, 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 the deep learning approach to, to, to modeling language in this context really struggles because it's all token based. And I cannot have such a large dictionary for uh, and these, these approaches to scale well. So I was wondering what approaches would you see potentially powerful in, in such a context where you're trying to infer knowledge about these genes, but where you, you cannot easily tokenize these um, where also in many cases you could probably indeed reason by analogy because yeah. if you say one gene, I don't know, increases the activity of another yeah. gene, that, 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 is a, that is a pattern that will occur a lot. Yeah. So in this context, how would you approach this and where do you see the strengths and the weaknesses of the different okay. schools of thought? So, so I would, I would, um, so the most, most relevant thing I know about is Scott Friedman's work on DARPA's big mechanism program. So big mechanism, for those of you who haven't heard about it, is a DARPA attempt to do kind of modern biology, looking at the mechanisms underlying cancer. And it was one specific kind of cancer. <clears throat> and they had multiple teams doing lex lexical, lexical resources, right? Multiple teams. And it turns out, it just, I mean, just, you said biology is complicated. Dear God, is it complicated. So they took the same tools that they used for this particular cancer pathway that was the drive, such a driving example, off to the program, tried it on something else, juvenile diabetes, totally fell apart. They basically would have had to start from scratch, right? And yet it's still genetic regulatory pathways, right? Same underlying mechanism, but different particular bits of instantiations of those mechanisms. That's why when someone talks about optimizing things, biologists tend to go, Bleh, right? Because we're not optimized, we're just not. So I would argue we're optimized for flexibility. <laughs> oh, we're okay. longevity. I mean, there's all, if we could build robots as good as we are, <laughs> it would be a better world. Uh, but, but Scott, Scott did two things on, on 
on big mechanism. One is he basically did a version of BERT that would extract um, QP knowledge from biology. So, so you could basically put in an article and would put out qualitative proportionalities in terms of biological entities. Now that's using, you know, lexical resources from that program, right? So it's not fully general purpose. He also, in a different DARPA program, trained the same system to pull out QP models on uh, sort of social science domains. Okay. And this got me very excited. It's like, Scott, I want this system. Can I please have the system? He said, sure, but let me warn you, you have to do all this hand annotated training data for every new domain, <clears throat> right? Completely different training data for the social science thing, completely different for medicine. And by the way, this is true of everybody I know in this domain, right? Heng Ji from UIUC, chemistry, agriculture, same software, but in fact, the systems that do one can't do the other because the training data is completely different. Okay, so it's very, 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 very narrow. Now, the other thing Scott did was basically use an analogy in learning by reading because you're reading this text and you're trying to make sense of it. Well, can I match it to things I know so that it fits and helps bigger, build a bigger pattern? So he's done some really lovely work on that. And so again, I think that's one of the ways that you, know, you can use analogy as part of a bigger learning by reading system. So you may have all sorts of systems that are producing parses and deep structure knowledge. How do you integrate it? Analogy is really good at that. So, so I think you know, any complicated cognitive phenomena, there's lots of moving parts. And those moving parts sometimes can be done just by one technology, but in other cases, combining things builds you something that's more robust. Thank you so much. I think this is a wonderful way to close. Thank you so much again for your presentation. Thank you for having um, me. Thank you for joining us remotely. Um, goodbye.